had no idea if any of this was even practical. And it definitely should have been. It would have made what happened next a lot. And a different player track initiative worked wonderfully for several reasons. Arcane Anxiety is a 5th edition D&D homebrew campaign that I've been running for about a year and a half, almost two years now. The reason I chose to do a whole video about it is because it's become sort of an experimental campaign where I try out theories that I read about or come up with on my own and see if they work in practice or not. So here are all of the strategies that I've tried for DMing this campaign and what I've learned from trying them. Do they work? Do they not? I started Arcane Anxiety originally because I wanted to find out if strangers could get together and play in person. The answer to that question is sort of? It's risky. So many online D&D communities have accepted complete strangers into their games. It's heartwarming to see that sort of thing happen and makes me remember why I like these communities in the first place. And even though these communities do it all the time, I still can't honestly say that it works every time. I've found that it really does help if the people at the table know each other. In Arcane Anxiety, I picked three people that I know from different areas outside the game and invited them all to play because they all played D&D, just never with each other. They didn't know each other at all. The character relationships had a pretty rough time, especially at the beginning, partially because we were still figuring out what each other's playstyles were. In retrospect, we definitely should have talked about this beforehand, but we didn't, and it led to a very rough start. Eventually, we settled on a more story-centric style of play, because that's what I think I'm best at, and it's what the players wanted to experience. This was never actually said out loud, and it definitely should have been. It would have made what happened next a lot easier. Two players at the table had very conflicting styles of play. One of them loves to optimize everything from their character to the actual plot of the story. They will plan out even just a single day in town. The other player loves keeping secrets from the party. You can imagine that this didn't really go well with the player that likes to plan things. The players like each other outside of the game, but inside the game, the characters clashed way too often. At a certain point, the negative tension got so high and so uncomfortable that I had to pick one of the players to actually kick out of the campaign. Eventually, I had to make the decision to ask the Secret Keeper to leave, based solely on the fact that he was already in some of my other campaigns. As for the planner, this was the only D&D he was playing at the time. After the Secret Keeper left, we invited a third player to the campaign, someone whose playstyle we knew would mesh well with what we were already doing. Now, arguments between characters are rare, and arguments between players, non-existent. So, with a good group finally together, I could move on to my next experiment. Delegating combat work to players. In my main campaign, the one I put the most time and effort into, I had a combat in which I was doing way too much work. The pauses where I was thinking, doing math, and making decisions were way too long and the players were losing interest. They got their phones out and started talking about things outside the game. In retrospect, this was definitely my fault for having seven unique enemies in the same combat. But I learned from it, and I figured I'd try to fix a few things using my experimental campaign. I took a look at all of the tasks that were taking too much time for me to do, and of those tasks, which ones the players could, in theory, do for me. By giving these tasks to my players, I could make my job easier by taking loads off my plate, and I would keep the players' interest because they would have more to do than just tell me what they try to do on their turn. But I had no idea if any of this was even practical. So the next time Arcane Anxiety saw combat, I gave my players two jobs. One, keep track of initiative, and two, keep track of the monster's hit points. Having a different player track initiative worked wonderfully for several reasons. First, after I say roll initiative, if I have everything pre-rolled, I can spend that time setting up the map, writing down hit points, and doing other prep for the combat. This was the main reason that I delegated this task to another player, but there was a happy, unexpected benefit. So as I'm setting up minis, a player is taking down initiative. Okay, 15 to 10. Serial got 13. DM3 got 11. Wait, DM3? There's only two enemies on the map. Yep. Tension and excitement always spike 
when players find out there's another enemy, especially when they don't know where the enemy is or how powerful it is. Fear of the unknown is a great way to keep your player's attention. The second piece of work I delegated out was keeping track of the boss's hit points. This one didn't work as well. To do this without revealing the boss's maximum hit points, you just have that player calculate how much damage that creature has taken through this whole combat. Every now and then, I'd ask that player how much damage they'd taken, and I would give a description of how injured the boss was looking. I still had the option to increase the maximum hit points if the combat was too easy or was going to be over too soon, and I still had the option to decrease the maximum hit points if I saw a TPK coming. Unfortunately, this didn't work as well as I was hoping. The player that had this task assigned to them often forgot to actually write down the damage that this creature was taking because it was a new task that they weren't used to having. Maybe this player just wasn't suited for the job. Maybe nobody is and it's a bad idea altogether. Since then, I've been keeping track of all the monster's hit points. The third task I delegated to players in Arcane Anxiety was to let them help me with the description of what was happening. Instead of saying, I attack the goblin, how exactly are they going to do that? Are they going to take a wide swinging arc toward its knees, or are they going for a pommel strike to try to break its nose? Once the players got used to it, some really cool and wild things started happening. They started to flavor exactly how their character has a tendency to fight, and even what their spells look like. For example, Eldritch Blast. I used to always say, you shoot two bolts of energy at your opponents, but recently, one of my players wound her backstory into exactly what that spell looks like. Her mother is a lawyer in hell, so her Eldritch Blast looks like the text of an infernal document coming out of her fingertips and searing into the skin of her enemy. Both having players describe what their attack looks like and having one player keep track of initiative has really freed up a lot of space in my brain to keep track of other things in combat. There's one other way I make combat easier for myself on many occasions, but it has nothing to do with delegating work to a player. A few years ago, I saw one of Matt Colville's running the game videos, and it was about how 4th edition rules, hear me out, it was about how 4th edition rules can help in 5th edition combat. Two of the biggest issues I have in combat are keeping track of the monster's hit points and action economy. Action economy is basically the idea that whichever side has the most actions or attacks will win. Using 4th edition minions can fix both of these issues. To make a minion, you first take an appropriate low challenge rating monster. Then you reduce its hit points down to one, and there you go, you have a minion. Now you can throw a bunch of them into the battle, both to soak up the player's actions and it makes the players feel much more powerful as they mow through dozens of enemies at once. They don't even have to roll damage. Once a minion gets hit, it dies because there's no way for an attack that hits to do less than one hit points worth of damage. The only real drawback to minions is keeping track of where they are and what they're doing because there's so many of them. To mitigate this, I have the minions take their whole turn in groups. Everybody moves at once, everybody attacks at once, then everybody that hit gets to deal their damage. So these three charge at PC1, and these three charge at PCB. Then I'll roll all three attacks against PC1. Only one hits, so that character takes 1d6 plus four damage. Two attacks hit player character B, so that's a total of 2d6 plus eight damage. This is much faster than going over what each minion does on their turn individually. Minions have always worked well whenever I've thrown them onto the field, but I've never actually seen anyone else use this. If you've used it, or if you know of a D&D stream that does use it, please let me know how it goes, or throw the link in the comments and I will take a look. In the meantime, on to the next experiment. Virtual tabletops or cameras and minis. Almost every community has been affected by this COVID pandemic and the tabletop RPG community is not an exception. I had to switch all of my in-person campaigns to online. I discovered the existence of Roll20 and other virtual tabletop apps. I tried out Roll20, I really did. I learned as much as I could and saw the potential of how cool this product could be. But whenever I actually used it, there were always technical issues. Most of them stemming from my players not wanting to actually take time and learn how it works. All of my sessions were turning into learning how to use Roll20 instead of playing D&D. So after a while, I took a look at my hundreds of dollars worth of miniatures sitting there being unused. So I started using video calls instead of Roll20. I had a camera pointing at a tabletop 
showing where the minis are and using the pieces of terrain I had, and it was kind of difficult for the players to tell exactly where their characters are, but it entirely cut out the technical issues that Roll20 was giving us. Plus, it's way easier to just put down terrain in minis than it is to draw out a map and select tokens that fit the theme. I also began to learn about lighting techniques to make it look better and got back into building terrain myself. Everything I had learned about Arcane Anxiety up to this point had been real, physical. It was time to start experimenting with the story I was telling. Every campaign I run is going to have at least a few sessions where I do little to no prep. One of the worst times to underprepare is right after a big story arc when the players are going to be looking for new plot hooks. So when I accidentally underprepared for one of these important prep sessions, I had to ad lib a very important story point. I randomly picked a fetch quest, and I made up this story about how a UNT was terrorizing travelers with a staff of thunder, and the quest giver was this merchant that really wanted that staff. So when they took the job and the session ended, I sat down and I had to plan out a story arc that I was not expecting. I took the fetch quest that I thought was going to be one or two sessions, and my players thought so too. But what it turned into was a 12 session epic. I built an entire jungle that I knew was there but had never put any time or effort into. It's history, it's geography, the creatures that lived there. I delved into Yuan-T culture for the first time, their history, their religion, and to put a cherry on top of it all, Fizzbond's Treasury of Dragons had just come out, so I threw a Green Dragon Mastermind into the mix. It ended up being a fantastic arc, and I do not regret expanding this itty bitty plot into this story arc. I didn't even build it all right away, right after that session. I was still building it halfway through it. The twist at the end didn't even occur to me until the second from the last session. The lesson I learned here is that it is okay if an adventure takes way more sessions to complete than you originally thought it did. In my opinion, it's better to have a plot that's too long than a plot that is cut short. I have one last tip for you that I learned from this campaign, and it has to do with a specific magic item. Arcane Anxiety is a very, very high magic campaign. Ever since level nine or 10, every single party member has had all three magic item attunement slots filled at all times. And for the last several sessions, they've been walking around with two god-made artifacts. To compensate for this obvious power increase, I've been calculating encounters as if the players were two or three levels higher than they actually are. Of the plethora of items that I've given them in this campaign, there is only one that I regret. It's not either of the god artifacts, and it's not even an item that's listed in the Dungeon Master's Guide. The only item I regret giving them and the only one I'm considering taking back is their shield guardian. This thing essentially soaks up all of the meaningful damage that I can do to one of the players. In addition to that, it gives the fighter an AC of 30. Plate mail, a plus one shield, the shield spell, and the shield guardian's reaction. I know this is cool, and I know my players really love it, but I haven't had an encounter where they use the shield guardian that I've been able to balance without just deleting the construct with a banishment spell or something. I'm not telling you to never give a shield guardian to your party. They love it and we still have a good time, but you have been warned that it will unbalance your game. Well, that's all of my hard earned lessons from this campaign. I think I know which one of these is going to be the most unpopular, but let me know what you think in the comments and I will read through all of them. And while I'm doing that, and preparing for my next video, I need you to remember that everything is going to be okay.